Strength of America podcast. Welcome to Strength of America podcast, episode 31. Bob Davis. Bobby Davis. Good to have Bobby back. I'm back from Nebraska. I appreciate all you guys. We had a great episode last week, episode 30. We, As of today, we had over 2,000 hits on that video, which is exciting. A lot of people viewing, getting it in, which is great. I know that's a big part for me is just getting back some of my Nebraska roots and how I started and getting that program. So that's great. I appreciate all the, the emails and messages and stuff from that and expanding our audience out there has been great. So good to get back to that. We have some more things planned getting back to that. And one of them uh, off camera afterwards, Boyd invited me back next year. Uh, it's exciting. It's actually his 50th anniversary since he started the strength and conditioning program at the University of Nebraska. And that's also my anniversary, the 30th anniversary of Strength of America that same week. So that's pretty exciting to get all that. So we'll have a lot of stuff building into that as well. And uh, when I get back there, we're going to do an interview a lot more with Zach and David and so many other uh, staff while I'm back there for that too. So that'll be great. Keep in contact. We want to get back some of the basics, I think, as I've been getting, you know, emails and different things from people and looking at stuff your programs and what we're really doing. What is the best workout program for athletes? And if you're not already subscribed to our page, get uh, into it, make sure you subscribe below, hit the button so you get notifications each time. Uh, and then let's get into this episode, try and find out what your program may be missing. So I think one of the first things we look at, which most don't pay attention to, is injury prevention, you know, mobility. And I think that's what why I started Strength of America 29 years ago is because of the number of injuries that I had, fellow athletes did, our careers ended because of it. We didn't know what to do about conditioning. Uh, I figured, well, injuries happen and you move on, that's it. Well, since then we've learned we can do a lot to reduce that. And one of the first things we should be checking in a program, do they check you and your mobility, how you move, where your ankle flexibility is? Are you tight one side compared to another? What's your quad hamstring ratio? What's going on with your hips and back? Are you the typical high school athlete that's got that rounded shoulder because we do bench press all the time and don't do any posterior chain movement or flexibility? So I think that's one of the things that we've really stressed a lot through the years and Bobby's gotten involved in and, and knock on wood, all those years of competing with Bobby and wrestling to get through all that without having a major problem like old dad did all those years with five knee surgeries and three shoulder surgeries by the time I was 21. And to keep him healthy and out of that, he's been a great uh, just example of what the program really is about. I mean, many kids that have followed that as well. So mobility, do you guys even get that checked? Does anybody look at that or talk to you about that in your program? Because uh, I think where a lot of it's gone from is strength and power, bigger, faster, stronger, all that, which is great. But like we've always said, you're the biggest, fastest, strongest guy, but you pull a hamstring because your immobility problems going on, movement, lack of strength or flexibility in that area. You're the biggest, strongest, fastest guy they've got sitting on the sidelines watching the game because he's injured. So that's terrible. So what are some of the things that you do with the mobility and, you know, or trying to see where they may have a problem? Is it strictly just have them go through each stuff with it or watching how they move? Yeah. Uh, we don't really have the time at this school to take and cater a full day to just mobility screening or different things like that. We don't have the tools for it. Um, so a lot that I just do is as I'm going through and I'm instructing them, like if I'm getting new athletes in or this and that, and we're going through a day, we're working on like squat regressions, progressions or something, just getting kids in. Um, then I'll kind of go around and, and shift kids around while they're going through, seeing, you know, if they can get to a position where we want them to or this and that. Um, and then we kind of go from there on it. Uh, my biggest thing, though, is just checking mobility and how they move through just stuff in the weight room or stuff out there in movement. Uh, a lot of it right away, you can tell if it's like an ankle mobility issue, you can, it, it's pretty well seen if they're going through and doing like a landing drill or something like that, or, or doing some different change of direction, or they're in here trying to do a squat or a single leg variant, you'll see right away. Um, and, I, and I think that's a big part that, you know, we don't want it to come across as, okay, now you've got to get somebody else to evaluate. You've got, you got a hundred football players out there and you got to go through and check each of them on the mobility of the ankle. You'll see as soon as they squat. But what we don't want you to do is, okay, well, this one's got problem with mobility in the ankle. He can't squat to a depth or whatever, so we don't do squats until he gets mobility. Yeah. No, we've got a squat, but we modify how we do that. And then we, he does the extra work, the homework, on yeah. mobility. Okay, his extra stretching he's got to do or things against the wall, whatever they're doing. 
they they are responsible for that and then you keep checking them on it as well yeah but that way we can keep going all the way through it that's like saying the squats well if we can't squat to a certain depth or do this we don't until we get to that point uh, well you've got to keep them moving you've got to get up into there so that's the first part of it is mobility but you can do it without having everybody okay sit against the wall let's see where you're at here with your hamstrings let's see this you can see the movement as we go now when we do testing we test their speed agility all of that we'll do take them through some basic things for their hamstring mobility their hips rotational things we'll do some checking on some stretches through there because it doesn't take long we can check that real quick go through a checklist and get it done our baseball players our swimmers we can check the, the flexibility of their chest the shoulders where they're at uh, thoracic mobility you can check those pretty easily and you should do that because I can tell you most of them we can tell automatically without them saying whether they're right or left-handed we'll do a check for the rotator cuff or movement in there we can tell right away what they are because they're a lot tighter on that side so which also that leads to our other thing we talked about which is we gain strength you know and, and I don't worry as much about my little skinny kid getting hurt unless a little skinny kid wants to play football with a 230 pound guys then yeah we got to worry about that but just movement where he's at he's not strong enough doesn't it produce enough force generally there's always exception but those kids generally don't have enough muscle mass size strength to produce enough power when they make a cut that they're going to blow out their knee when we concentrate so much on the strength getting him strong but we don't work on movement that's the next part we talk about is a movement that's when we have problems and that leads to our ACL, which we've got an exciting project. We're getting closer to you know letting you know about coming out on ACLs. But um, movement is key. And if they're not flexible, they're not mobile, and they're strong and powerful, but they've got mobility issues, they're at greater risk of getting hurt than a little skinny guy. So we've got to make it hand in hand. So movement is what we want, or our mobility, that's our first thing. Because it has to be based on the program injury prevention. If not... I don't I've never liked the idea well we've got another guy coming up that can take his place we've got to take care of each of these kids so that's the first thing we've got to look at then we start building and expanding on that so from there then we also take a look at movement Bobby was talking about earlier we can talk a lot you know in the weight room is one thing but out on the field out on the court when we're testing them we're doing a pro agility chest the 510-5 right away you can see where they're at some of them move well some turn some make great cuts with the right leg but when they change to the left, they just can't do it. They pause or they lean and come back. That tells us what we need to work on. And what we do is teach these kids, when we're doing drills out there, we know what happens. Human nature is we work on our strong side. We do those drills over and over. If we're really good on shooting from the, the far right side of the, of the court, we do that all day long. The left side, we can't so much. We stay on the right. Well, the other team's going to pick it out quick. You know what? Guard them heavy over on this side. When they get to this side, you can let up. Somebody else can shoot because this guy can't shoot from that side. We've got to be able to make cuts hard left and right no matter where we're at. So it has to be equal. Find the weak spots and, and build up on that. What are some of the mobility things that you look for, Bobby, with them? Or what things that they do, whether it's power, what all is it taking a look at? Their speed, how they change direction, uh, jump landing? Yeah, a lot, a lot of it comes in, like, let's say it's like ankle mobility, for example. You'll see when somebody, like, jumps up, they go to land, and they try to react to move or to re-jump up. They don't have the ankle mobility for it. Um, it's, it's just not going to – they're going to look more like a tomato splatting against the ground versus, like, a bouncy ball where it can hit and react. Um, and, and a lot of that also, same thing if we're going to change the direction. Uh, maybe they're real good on one side. They go to make a change on the other side. They don't have the ankle mobility to – allow and bend down there so they then compensate somewhere else they drop their chest or head body starts to shift different things like that so then you can pick up on that too if you're on another team it's just the little things that work for it's just as simple as that um, and then other things we um i have different kids with poor hip mobility issues so coming to some change of direction where they're opening up to a directional step or open up step or different things like that you know it's just not as sharp or as clean um, same thing for like sprinting if a kid's real tight up in the hips and they can't get that leg to load as high as they need to to redrive, um, they're going to have short, um, very quick steps, but they're not going to cover any ground. Um, so just some different things like that. A yeah. uh, big thing that you can notice right off the bat is uh, I've had a couple kids that struggle getting down for a deadlift. Uh, part of it's a little taller, but the other part, they just can't bend very well uh, at the hips, at the ankle. Um, squats, can't get the hips back and behind, can't get a whole lot of depth there. Um, and start to see his ankles rise up and start to crash forward. Well, he's not trying to crash forward. It's not like he's not trying to get his hips back or get that cue. It's just that he just physically can't do it. 
So we had some different things like that going on. And then the main thing that I do, I don't have a lot of time with these kids and it goes very fast, especially with the amount that we get in here. Uh, so they get homework. I always have the kids let me know if they have any tightness or anything, or if I see something starting to spark up, I'll throw them in a situation, have them check it out or check a stretch and uh, kind of see, and we can start to problem solve and shoot. And uh, then from there, they've got to work on it on their own. Um, I think that's where we got to think about giving them a little responsibility and accountability, um, especially because when we're in here, we have to train when we're in here. We can't do all that other stuff. I can't send a kid over here to work on some mobility things because they're not doing it on their own. And now everybody else is working out and they're sitting over here doing some stuff. So uh, big on making them train and, and giving them some stuff to work on outside that. And once they start doing it, they'll start to see some differences and they'll start feeling better. And then they start to get a little more excited. So helps a ton. And then they'll start pulling that in more. You know, getting back with that movement stuff going into it. That's You'll see the ones that have great cuts and great movements from right to left but have problems left to right and they go. So we've got to work on those kind of skills as we go. Jumping and landing. Just like the ACL injuries, most of them happen. 70% of those are from non-impact. It's how they land, how they make a cut, what's happening through their balance, strength, flexibility, the mobility, all of that plays into effect. So you've got to implement that and put into it. So just simply doing jump tests, how they jump, how they land. Are the knees rolling in? Are they landing going forward? What's happening to the body? Are they straight-legged? That movement you evaluate all the time. I and mean, we get plays on how they're, their speed and how they get where they're going, that's fine. But We've got to put that together, how they put that power, how their body is. Our movement is also my change of the, you know, that uh, control of melon is big. It's just for that. It came from watching some kids move, and they, they make a cut. And when they do that, they pause, and their head kind of drops, and then they come back up. That's not a cut. That's a pause we move. So the body shifted too much. So we're teaching them how to drop, how to move, get the essentials. And just because I know as we're talking about this, you're going to have more questions going on. We're going to break each of these components up over the next four weeks. So that and, and do one segment each. So the next week, we're just going to do mobility. Then we're going to move into Pacific on, on movement. And then the next thing we want to talk about now is, is what everybody that thinks we have to do for conditioning is strength. And you're right. We've got to be strong. How we do it, how often we should lift, when should we lift, off-season versus in-season. Um, we were just talking about that beforehand, you know, the topic going into it. we still got some coaches and people out there that think in-season we shouldn't be in the weight room. We need to take that time off. We're going to wear them out. We've got to keep things going. What athlete, you work hard all summer long for our football players, and then during a three- to four-month season, you're not going to touch the weights or you do it once a week. The goal is you want to continue to get stronger and peak at the end of the season. Nobody can take three to four months off of strength training and maintain their strength. You've got to do it. And I've never been even a big believer in in-season and maintaining we yeah. still want it. These kids are adapting. If they're eating right and hydrating, fall in the next phases we're talking about, they'll continue to get better throughout the season, and that yeah. should be. If our mindsets on maintaining, you're more than likely getting worse. Uh, you're not pushing yourself. You're just doing what you think is comfortable or feels good. So uh, I'm not a big believer in that. I realize that after the first year, I used to call it maintenance and stuff like that, and you know it doesn't work that way. Yeah. It, it just really does not. Um, yeah, that's huge. I think people have to realize, especially in season, I've had kids come to me and just purely um, that haven't had the as intense a train in or it hasn't been as consistent throughout their season or this and that. They just come to me and they just feel, they just say they feel weaker. They don't feel as confident. Um, and that's something that's in season. You, you never want to lose your confidence. That's going to just derail your game, whatever you're doing. So I think when we talk about in season, we just got to think, it doesn't have to be anything super crazy. Lifts can be modified, but they can also be pushed, and they can be intense still. Uh, it just takes a little bit of some thinking behind the planning. Uh, and it takes consistency. Uh, I've seen teams in the past they that stick to two days a week, and it's like nothing to them. You know? um, and then I've seen teams that come in two days, and then one day, one week, and then two, and then one, and skip a week, and then come back, and they're wondering why they're sore. Well, it's like if you go two days one week and then you go one day the next week and then you come back for two days, you're going to be sore that week because you didn't do two days last week. You know, you had that time off. So people, if you just be consistent with it, no matter if you are nervous because you don't want to do it because it's a game day or pregame day or whatever it is prior to the game day, uh, it's better just to get, come in and get the work done. Things can be tailored, but just be consistent with what you're doing. Yeah, and that, that's the key for everything. And, and the consistency is is doing the work. doesn't mean doing the same thing all the time, but you change it. So in season, 
We don't have to go light. Man, we can still squat in season. Do our cleans, do all that kind of work in there, depending on the sport and what we're trying to do. But the yeah. goal is we've got to keep gaining strength and building in through that. So that's a must. But we also have to go back to mobility and the other things that are going on in movement. What are you seeing? How they move? What's going on? What are the things we need to do? You can't just have them all do the same thing. You have to have the same base program. That's great. But then you still have to tweak and modify for what those guys need. And, you know, that's our guys, girls, everyone out there. They have to have that program for them. Now, in saying that, I still, after all these years, I still get the parents of that 10-year-old out there that thinks they need a specialized strength and speed program for that 10-year-old quarterback. Well, I can tell you, most 10-year-olds, I don't care what sport they're involved in, they've got to get the basics, their movement, their body, their conditioning, how they eat, how to hydrate, uh, all of that together. Because we've seen now, I hope, enough of us are learning this specializing you know the injuries the number of injuries we're getting are incredible uh, i can't believe when i talk to a group of 13 14 year olds how many of them already know of somebody with an acl tear? how many baseball players we talk to that have already had shoulder and elbow problems by 14. most of the teams we talk to are in that situation so that gets back to the mobility the strength specific to what they need to do get that balance in there and and create that program for what they need to do but get the basics, get the basics and do them well. That's what we have to get into. So strength, that's a big part. We've got our mobility, our movement, our strength. Now everybody talks about speed. Yeah, we've got to have speed. That's great. Well, and there's different ways of going about it. I think, you know, in the past, traditionally what's happened is football is an example. They get done with their season, they want to sign up and then do track and do track all the thing. Well, track's great. We can work on that speed. But how many times a football player run a straight line the whole way down? And in track, how many of you guys actually work on decelerating, stopping, changing directions? So you've got months now of not doing any of that work. And no, we're not talking about doing football year round. Some of you do, but if you're going to track all the time and then you come back into summer conditioning where you've got to make a lot of cuts, you're going to have problems making those cuts. And that's when we also see a lot more injuries to the knees and ankles because they've forgotten how to do that. You gain speed, but not movement. That's like you could say, well, the, the golfers, they're out there, they don't want to lift weights. So the basketball player is going to throw off their shot. Well, you don't stop shooting baskets while you're doing your strength program. You do it, and your shot will adapt with you. But you can't take three months of shooting, lift hard, and then go back and expect your shot to be there. So you have to work that stuff at the same time. Not a lot, but just keep it up, I think, is important. Yeah, just little doses. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. Because again, we're not trying to talk about specializing year round and doing the same thing all the time, but we just got to think about doing uh, little things consistently or more often. You know, just just to make sure you're up on your craft. You know, you're you're moving well and you're not putting yourself in a bad situation. Yeah. So, so it, it pulls into our speed and how to do it. And there's a lot of ways. And we get to that segment on speed training. We're going to break a lot of different things to you. But you know, speed is speed's the king. We've got to have speed out there. But speed also can be that quick movement in that one yard speed and that 40 yard speed. So while we're at Nebraska, one thing Boyd and I talked about is some of the mistakes they did in the past is they had all these guys running two miles, you know, one, two, and four miles. And, and why are these guys doing that? Because on the field, nothing lasts more than four to six seconds. So why are you having these guys run that long? And think of how many drills and skills you could actually do during that two mile run time you've dedicated to it. So get specific to what they're doing. Uh, we've given a guideline out for years to coaches when they want to know how to work intervals and how to work things into the conditioning to get a practice. So you've got how many, you've already videoed games. You've got a game to have somebody there clock it. As they're watching that game on a playback, how long does that play last? Boom, three seconds, four. Okay, good. Now how long did you have before the next ball was snapped again? You know, or on the court or on the soccer field. You know what how the time is going. That's how you can set up some conditioning practice specific to what they need to do. It's like the baseball players or anybody else. Why are you having them run long distance? Why are you having linemen run long distance? Now, we're trying to drop some body fat, trying to do some things fine, but you've got a 240-pound, 280-pound guy, and you're having him run miles. What do you think that's going to do to his knees and his body pounding over and over? And they don't need to do that. You can find other things they can do. So specific to speed, look at that. How about power? What are some of the things? I mean, this is where some of the misconceptions, I think, happen with power. What kind of things do you see or do or what kind of power stuff or why is that an important part 
for our basketball players, for example, or anything else? Uh, I guess when I think power, um, I think it's someone that needs to be explosive. Um, but even before I think about that, I, I think about as we're going through, um, trying to think how good are their brakes? You know, their shocks and their brakes. We can't just have brakes. We have to have shocks. You have to have something to absorb. Uh, but as, as we're as we're going through, I got to see and I got to think. All right, you know, let's say we're doing some drops or some jumps and some landings. Okay, I got to first see how they can land. Uh, and outside of that, especially if it's a basketball athlete, I like to think about okay, how well they can can they drop and land. Like say, I'm having them stand on a small box, six inch box. But I'm going to step forward, drop, and land in a squat. I'm going to step sideways, the other side, backwards. Maybe I'm going to jump off rotationally. Um, then drop single leg in all those planes. Because i, I got to know that these kids can be able to accept force before they produce it. So uh, I'm big on kind of slow cooking that and getting them to think about landing and how they're landing in body position. Then from there, then we start to go to our jumps and hops and bounds and all that different stuff from there. But definitely, when I think about basketball, it's got to be, it can't just be vertical jump all the time. we got to work on some lateral jumps, some forward jumps, reverse, rotational, um, single leg, forward, sideways, rotational, reverse. You know, it's, it's got to be kind of multi-planar in that aspect, you know. And in a game, it's not always perfect where it's two feet up, two feet down, you know. And a lot of times it'll be two or one foot up, and then they're coming down, they get bumped on the way down, so they got to learn how to adjust by the time they hit the ground. I think a lot of times that's when we have ankle um, sprains, strains, irritations, different stuff like that. So they, they got to be durable at the ankle. Um, but outside of that, we just got to know that, you know, if I'm in a sport and they're multidirectional, I want to treat that same aspect when I talk about power development, at least move from the movement side. Outside of that, when we get in the weight room, you know, it, it becomes very um, kind of textbook in a sense. You know, when people are in the weight room, I like to think of the aspect that, uh, you know, they got to develop strength, they got to develop power, um, and they got to develop some stability and different things like that when they get in the weight room. Now, maybe cross country rider, I'm not so worried about them loading up on a back squat. Maybe they do like a landmine or goblet squat or something like that for a variance, for example. Um, but some other athletes, they might have them for a short time and they need to produce some power or they got to go up against a body and they're going to, they got to get under some load. So I think that's where it varies a little bit. But well, that's a good point too. I mean, you talk cross country, you know, someone's saying, well, I don't need that power or anything else. Think how many impacts that they have when they run, when they land, yeah. going downhills, or anything else going on. That's working power. That's deceleration stuff that we've got to work, and then that's something that people forget about. We need to jump. We got to jump up and down. But how we land, the movement, being able to stop, make cuts. If you don't have strong deceleration skills, you're not going to be able to make good cuts for your agility and getting that into it. And which will be our next topic here in a second. But think about that part. Are you guys really working on that? Or do you guys just do jumping drills all the time and nobody ever talks to you about how you land? Yeah. And not only that, but how you land and transition. Because in a game, it's not just jump up. Basketball, again, you're going up, get the ball or not, you've got to react and move. You get there, jump up, and you're down, and everybody else is down five to ten yards away from you. Now yeah, you're out of the play and you can't do anything. Yeah. So or, that's big. Or intent of how you're moving. Are you just, get coach just giving you so many jumps to do and are you going through it and then you just kind of, Coasting through, or are you trying to get the max out of what you can? Are you teaching your body how to create power on every single rep, or are you just coasting? Because if you're just coasting, by the time you get to a game situation, you can't expect it to be there. Uh, so that's something we got to think about. Now, outside of talking about basketball, okay, I know we're not in basketball season yet, but I got to think, let's say volleyball, for example. I got volleyball. Um, in certain positions do a lot of jumps, a lot of landings. So I got to think when we get to end season, uh, there's a lot of girls that I have not had in the program. You know, and I can't blast them with this um, large quantity of different jumps and different things because they're getting so many on the court already. Uh, now, at the beginning of the season, I can start to work some different things. We can work on some low-level jumps. I have to do a lot of depth drops where they're working on landing in different positions. But i gotta, I got to keep in mind that as they pick up games, I can't have them jumping all the time. You know, it, that's where the overuse starts to come in. So when I think about volleyball coming in, we're just making sure that they can adjust, they can land well. Um, when they're coming here, they're pushing their strength, and we're working on more movement, reaction, and speed, stuff like that. I don't want to beat them up because all that deceleration, like you're talking about, every time they land, they're decelerating. So if they're doing a bunch of reps out there, and they're practicing and in games, and they're coming in here and weightlifting, then it could be an issue. So, again, we just got to think smart, you know. Yeah, and that smart means, you know, we don't, because of bat, the volleyball team or some of them are doing a lot of jumping, we don't do it here. What I typically do with them, and, and Bobby does too when they come in, we still have them do a few reps and stuff to see where they're at because we want to keep monitoring because how many times is the coach there on the court, basketball and volleyball and all, 
watching to see what's going on with the knees. They've got yeah. other things they're working. So our job is to keep watching their jumping landing correctly. So we keep that in their heads so when they're on the field doing everything else, then they're going to be in the place. So we've got to do that. Um, so I think that's a that's a big part. Um, and, and the last part I want to say to power, and we'll expand more when we get to it, is how long you're actually training that power. Because, it, you know, if you're doing true power stuff, we used to go up stadium stairs because I want to get speed and I want to get power. Well, you can only do so many impacts, you know, per leg. After that, you're not producing power anymore. It can only be so many seconds. Beyond that, it's just raw conditioning. Yeah. That's like split squats. We do explosive, explosive things that are great. But if I'm having them do 100 split squats because they haven't been doing their mobility stuff, it's no longer power. It's just pure pain and, oh, yeah, I better start doing my work. And that's okay because you've got to find those things to make them work. But what are you really trying to do? And that's that's a big part. So next I think we get into our, our next part in the movement section, but it's it's under the agility. And here's where you can make some huge gains and, yeah. and make progress. You don't have to be the fastest kid out there. If you can make quick change of direction, you can make big plays on fast kids. Because we've seen a lot of fast kids that just don't have the brakes. They can't change direction quickly. So you've got an advantage if you're a little slower, but you've got a quick reaction and a cut. The fast guys are going to blow past you every time and have to come back to you. So that's where we can make some big gains on. And the fast guys learn how to decelerate, how to change direction and move. Nobody's stopping you. Yeah. So that's key. And I think in that where that agility and change direction and control the melon and all that, you get the essentials down, make sure you drop your hips, make contact with the ground, you've got a good footing, and you explode, making sure hips and head are facing the target you're after. That's the key, no matter what kind of agility drill they put you through. That movement, that basics is going to set you up. Yeah. Yeah. We get done with movement. Uh, we've got our uh, mobility, our movement, our strength, speed, power, agility, that's great. You've got a great training program, but who's talking to you guys about the other parts that are essential, which is our nutrition? You know, what are some key things that you do, and what have we done with Strength of America athletes and uh, help them understand that? A lot of times we just work on fuel charts. So over the summer, a lot of the athletes that I have, I hand them a fuel chart um, and basically just have them jot down a day what they're consuming. Um, we've gone over this with some of you guys before, but just to see. You know, we kind of work on that a little bit. It's nothing super crazy. We're just trying to make sure that they get the idea that uh, every time they eat, they're trying to find some source of lean protein, a good source of protein. Um, that they're thinking of each of their meals more so in the thought process of fueling sessions. Okay, what do I need to eat for my body for what I'm about to do? Um, and then outside of that, just trying to eat consistently throughout the day. You know, not large and then waiting a long time and then binging again or nothing for breakfast, a good sized lunch, and then a huge dinner and then going to bed. We're just trying to create a little better habits, make them a little more um, conscious and aware of what they're doing, what they're putting in their body. Um, and outside of that, making sure they're staying hydrated. Um, that's a big one. And I think a lot of people do a pretty good job at drinking a ton of water, but they drink too much sometimes and they flush the good nutrients out. Or they're not getting the salt or magnesium, things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm a big proponent now of uh, having kids just salt their food to taste. Um, that's huge to help them out. I think for a while we became scared of salt and sodium, um, and people need to realize that. Now, I do get some kids that are like, well, I did have a little bag of chips, you know, and, and plenty of salt. It's okay. It's like, all right, good salt. But I just listened to a talk recently, and most of the salts from table salt, that they, when they derive and pull it from the ground and put it in, that, uh, the way that they have to go do, or about that process, it takes away a lot of the nutrients and minerals and the good stuff that we need from those salts. So they found that more sea salts, specifically Himalayan sea salt, have more of those nutrients and pop properties to help keep you better hydrated. So that's something to get across to kids also. Um, yeah, you guys hearing that stuff from your coaches? That's what we want to make sure you guys understand. That's the yeah. whole thing is you've got to have a full program. And outside of that, just getting your sleep, you know, getting trying to strive for eight to nine hours. I know for us at the school, these kids have a lot of homework. If the academics are pretty, pretty tough here, but the kids just have to make sure that they're prioritizing their schedule and getting things taken care of, so that way they can get the most sleep that they can. Um, and again, it just boils down to consistency. You know, are you getting your water? Are you salting your food? Are you getting some pretty good meals, some protein in each? And are you trying to get the most sleep that you can each night? If kids do that, it makes a world of difference, especially as you get into a season. When you get in the heart and the deep part of your season, 
and let's say you don't have those things very well taken care of or finals are coming around you add that stress on top of it that's when injuries and everything's come about or your performance just tanks because you're not taking care of your body very well so like we we just had a couple our first jv game in school history which is pretty cool for us at chandler prep uh, but we had a lot of youngins that first time stepping out on the field especially for a jv game and competing and uh we had a kid, for example, that had a salad and a Gatorade that day, and that was all he had. So it, you can imagine he's cramped up pretty good. He's not able to perform at his highest, uh, just having some troubles. We had a lot of that going on. So there, there's some talks that are to be had to kind of coach these kids up and help them learn. Uh, nobody's ever going to be perfect, especially when they're young and they're in high school. I know how that was, you know, you're a kid. <laughs> but we just got to keep putting the bug in their ear and make sure they're right, on the right path there. It falls into that category we've talked about for a long time on the Bob isms. We learn one of two ways. We either learn by listening and watching all the stuff Bobby's saying, all of that. And then some of them learn with a two by four when they're playing that game. It's 108 degrees out there and they have that salad and water is all they had and things are crapping and they realize, oh crap, maybe I do need to eat a little bit more and follow the, the routine. So it's okay. Either way, as long as we're not getting injured during that process, we figure it out and then we move on. But we want to put this together as a basis for a lot of you because, you know, like I said, the notes and things that we get from people, that's one of the big things are, you know, what's a, what's a big program? Or they ask about one section of it and forget the big picture. So we got to make sure the big picture is there. And that's what this big picture is about. All of these components, make sure they're there. And if they're not, ask us more questions about it or make sure the coaches get this information. And they, they watch these follow sequences so they can get the complete picture because you want to be your best. You got to put the whole thing out there. So. We appreciate you guys following us again, keeping on with it. Please pass this on to your teammates, other people going out there, your coaches, so we can get them in to help them understand a little bit more because we're here to help. You know, I said after starting my 30th year right now at Strength of America, we've got to do a lot more and we want to do a lot more. So make sure you subscribe. Uh, hit the button for notifications. Like it, share it, spread the word out as much as you can. Comments, let us know information or questions, things you've got. Email us. We'll have the email down there, thesoapodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we'll be ready for the next week. So like I said, we're going to break these down and then expand more on each of them. So you have that. But if you've got questions on any topics, let us know. We'll make sure that's part of the upcoming shows that we've got. And we'll keep you up on our uh, another exciting program we got on ACL Injury Prevention Program. So awesome. I'll let you know. Don't forget to click that bell and share it. So make sure you try to take a quick second just to share it with somebody. Uh, I know going through, you can click on a link to just share it in a text pretty quickly. Some other things like that. So we, we greatly appreciate it. Yeah, we really do. Appreciate that. And uh, we'll look for you the next week. But thanks again. We'll see you next time. See you later. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.